This is Dummy World. Let's see. I don't even know what to say. (laughs) Welcome to Demi World. I'm Cindy. And I'm Kelly. And I know that we said that we were going to do like mysterious sites or archaeological things. Yeah, archaeological. And and that's what I started doing. And then the archaeological site I picked, like by the time I was done writing everything up, it took, it would have been five minutes. (laughs) I was like, oh, 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 that's really quick that was that's nothing there's no information there yeah um so I started looking around to see what else I could do and then I got off track and and all of a sudden it wasn't archaeological I did something ancient and okay. uh, it wasn't until I was done where I was like ah no one had to dig anything up <laughs> <laughs> well I guess that's okay I mean I I, I don't see a problem with that mine is yeah. archaeological um but I don't know. I'm just not very excited about it anymore now that I've researched it. That was so. the thing was when I was digging. Ha, 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 I didn't even mean to. Oh, make what that a pun. pun. Uh, I didn't even mean to. Um, but when I was like <laughs> digging through archaeological sites to try to find one that was interesting, nothing was really interesting to me. Mm-hmm. And then I think when I found the one that I'm doing, I was like, oh, I like this. And then it never occurred to me it's not archaeological, really. I found one yesterday that I wish I had thought about sooner. I was like, well, maybe I could use it for nautical stuff because it's like ocean sort of. I'm like, well, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. But um, do you want to go ahead and start? Tell me yours. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, tell me my non-archaeological one. Yes, please do. For the archaeological episode. <laughs> um, so the one I did is called the Codex Gigas. Okay. Or the Devil's Bible. Have you heard of it? I have not. Cool. I'm excited to tell you about it. Okay, great. Let's do this. Um, The Codex Gigas translates from Latin to Giant Book or Giant Book of Laws. Cool. It is a medieval illuminated manuscript from early 13th century Bohemia, which is in modern day Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. The Codex Gigas is three feet tall, almost two feet wide, nine inches thick, and weighs about 165 pounds. So it's not a book that you would just put in your pocket and walk around with. (laughs) No, not anymore. (laughs) Um, It takes two people to carry it. I bet. I bet. So it has 310 pages of vellum. It originally had 320 pages, but 10 have been removed and are missing for unknown reasons containing Hmm. unknown information. Interesting. But we'll come back to the missing pages later. Okay. Okay. Apparently, the 320 pages of vellum required the skins of 160 donkeys. God damn. I know. That's a lot of donkeys. It's a bad time to be an ass. <laughs> According to legend, the book was written by Herman the Recluse, or in Latin, Hermanus Hermeditus. <laughs> okay. is that adorable? <laughs> I'm going to name my next dog that, or maybe my next donkey. <laughs> there you go. Donkey for sure. <laughs> Herman the Recluse was a Benedictine monk who lived in a monastery about 90 miles east of Prague. Benedictine monks are of the Catholic order, and that's all I'm going to say about that because I can't with the long and confusing history of Catholicism. (laughs) You're like, I just don't do it. I don't do anything about Catholicism. (laughs) I mean, I try, and I never understand. Well, I remember when you did stigmata, you're like, I don't get it. I just don't understand it. (laughs) That's why when it came to, I was like, ooh, I'm going to Google what a Benedictine monk is and what their beliefs are. And then then I was like, four hours later, you're like, "Mm, nope. Still don't understand. (laughs) Um, So I couldn't find much information on Herman the Recluse's life other than he was a monk who had committed some atrocious sin, which was possibly breaking his monastic vows. Uh, Probably having something to do with a donkey. (laughs) Um, but it's not actually specified anywhere what he did. Okay. But I believe that the trifecta of Benedictine vows are poverty, chastity, and obedience. And you know, it's so probably that's... it's probably chastity. He got caught doing something probably with someone of the same gender, perhaps. Ooh, possibly. Um, so it's obedience to the church and then also to that particular monastery's rules. Okay. 
So as a punishment for whatever atrocious sin he committed, the legend says he was walled up and either forced to inscribe holy texts for the rest of his life, or he was walled up and left to starve to death. That sounds like the worst, like, thousand sentences ever. (laughs) Yeah. So he supposedly made a deal with the abbot of his monastery that if he wrote a book that contained all the world's knowledge, his life would be spared. Oh. So he wrote the Codex Gigas. Okay. Some historians believe it would take someone 30 years to write the manuscript um, and at least uh, 20 years of nonstop writing. Okay. And the handwriting experts do believe that it was written by just one person. And the manuscript was actually signed by Hermanus Monicus Inclusus, which translates to Herman the Enclosed Monk. That's interesting that he signed it. Mm-hmm. Usually they didn't, like, sign things or attribute names to things. That's quite a piece of work, so I'm not surprised that he'd want, I guess, maybe some recognition for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it seems to me that the name Herman the Enclosed Monk means he's probably being held against his will as opposed to a self-imposed reclusion. Possibly. But I wonder where the name Herman the Recluse from, like where the name came from, if it was given to him during his life or after his life. It might have been one of those things that was given to him by others that because he was cloistered or whatever, Mm -hmm. like locked away that he was reclusive. Like, you know... Maybe they made it more self-imposed than actually under lock and key. Right. So the legend about the manuscript are that it was written in far less than 30 years. Some stories say that Abbott gave Herman one year and other stories say one night. Oh, wow. Okay. Either way, it was not enough time to be able to produce a manuscript such that was produced. Okay. So around midnight either after a year of writing or after a day of writing, Herman realized he was never going to finish the manuscript by dawn. And so he started crying until a little man appeared and started spinning all the straw into gold. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, wrong Oh, story. okay, Ruppel's still seeing. Okay, I was like, what, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, cool, this is where that story comes from. <laughs> so Herman actually called upon the devil and sold his soul in exchange for the finished finished manuscript. I almost did a devil sell their soul story. I almost did one. Oh, really? For, for this, today? yeah, for this. Oh. <laughs> so the contents of the manuscript are two Hebrew two Hebrew alphabets, the Church Slavic alphabet, the Gogolithic alphabet, which is the oldest Slavic alphabet, the entire Vulgate version of the Latin Bible, Old and New Testament. Minus the Book of Acts and Book of Revelations. And I believe this version of the Latin Bible is the official Latin version from the 4th century that's still used today. Wow. Okay. Two works by Titus Flavius Josephus, a Romano-Jewish historian born in Jerusalem in the 1st century. A list of the brothers in the monastery. A calendar of saints. A short history of Bohemia. Some notes on exercising evil spirits. The Life History of Cosmos of Prague, a priest, writer, and historian from the 11th century. An etymological encyclopedia written by Isidore of Seville. Medical writings, including two books from Constantine the African, an 11th century physician, and also some writings of Hippocrates. A portrait of Josephus, a drawing of a squirrel, drawings of plants, geometric shapes, pictures of creation, earth, and heaven. And apart from Josephus and the squirrel, there are no other humans or animals depicted in the manuscript. It sounds like somebody was walking through, like 10 people were walking together with their own little note cards, and they all bumped into each other, and it all (laughs) flew up into the air, and it all just got shuffled together into one book. That's so (laughs) disjointed. (laughs) Um, And also, uh, most importantly, really, is a full-page picture of the devil. Oh, Elzebub, if you will. Interesting. Is he horned and everything? Have you seen it? I have. He is horned. Um, okay. So that's why some people refer to this book as the devil's Bible, apart from the whole the devil helped me write it legend. Mm-hmm. So the devil's on page 290 of the manuscript opposite a drawing of the heavenly city. Okay. The devil honestly looks like one of those little monster thingies from where the wild things are. Oh, yeah. Okay. 
I've never read the book, but um, it, look, he looks just like it. Um, he has a human body, but clawed hands and feet, a green head and horns, and a serpent-like tongue, but there's no tail. Okay. And it looks like it's squatting with its hands raised over its head. I guess kind of. I guess like it's sitting or crouching. And the drawing takes up almost the whole page, so the devil's almost three feet tall. Okay, he's, wow. He's wearing, oh, yeah, because it's a big book, right? I forgot about yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Um, he's wearing an ermine loincloth, and ermine is a weasel, and mm-hmm. on all royalty robes where you see, like, the black comma-shaped things on the white background, mm-hmm. that's ermine fur. Yeah. And it signifies royalty. Yeah, it's a, um, it's a common thing in, like, Renaissance paintings. They'll have ermines in the paintings. Mm-hmm. So the supernatural legend sometimes say the devil drew the portlet portrait himself or that he was given such a large representation by Herman as a thank you for helping me write this book. Yeah, an homage. So the historical events in the Codex stop at the year 1229. And we know the book bounced around a few monasteries from the 13th century until 1596 when it was sent to Prague to be part of the emperor's collection. And after the Thirty Years' War, which ended in 1648, it was taken by the Swedes as war booty and taken to the Swedish Royal Library in Stockholm, where it sits today. Oh, spoils of war. Apart from the one year it spent on, quote, loan in Prague in 2007-2008, because it seems to me that it should probably go back to the Czech Republic. (laughs) Yeah, a lot of things need to go back where they belong. Um, Also, the book was saved from a fire at the Royal Library in 1697 by being tossed out of a window. Oh, shit. (laughs) Some loose sheets of the manuscript flew out and were never recovered, um, but these were not the 10 missing pages I mentioned earlier. Those had been cut out. Interesting. I wonder what they depicted. Um, The missing pages are thought to have contained the rules for a Benedict monk because there's a table of contents of sorts and those rules are listed in the table but they're not in the current book Hmm. however the rules are short and aren't expected to take up 10 pages right so conspiracy theories about the missing pages are it contains information mortals can't handle (sighs) it contains it contains magic spells Mm, mm -hmm. or it contains instructions and what to do in the event of an apocalypse yeah, because we don't want anybody to have that information. <laughs> no, and that's 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 the Codex Gigas. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. So he either wrote it, it probably took 30 years to write, but the tale is it either, it either took him one night or a year with the help of the devil. Correct, yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I wonder what rule he broke. Who knows? I mean, it, poverty, chastity, or obedience. It was one of those three. I wonder if he editorialized the rules in the Mm. book and people are like, no, 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 we can't have those in there. We have to get rid of those. They keep it too much commentary on them or something. I think that the pages were in there for a couple hundred years because um, they needed that monastery needed money eventually. And so they sold the book to another monastery and when they sold the book to the monastery, that's kind of when they wrote the book, the table of contents, so that mm. they knew everything that was they were sending to the monastery. And so the rules of the monks were in that table of contents. So I'm I'm assuming that they were cut out at a different monastery for who knows what reason. I wonder if they started selling off parts of the book individually. Mm, maybe. Like a couple, someone's like, oh, I'll, I'll give you like X amount of money for these benedictine monk rules back here and they're like take them yeah or maybe because it was a different monastery they had different rules and they wanted to get those out of the book i don't know yeah i mean we could speculate all fucking day right we're never gonna know that's interesting i've never heard of it before yeah i hadn't either it's a big book too it's a big freaking book man So, yeah, you would have to use vellum. Yeah, you'd have to use a large animal to get that much. I mean, cows, typically, I think is what they used. But, oh, poor donkeys. (laughs) It's a lot of donkeys. I wonder where they got them all from. Well, you know, they always have 
little monks riding around on their donkeys in pictures. Maybe they just keep them. Yeah. Maybe they just, that's, you know, a way they make money. They breed asses for farmers and stuff like that. Who knows? Right. Who knows? I know they make beer sometimes and cheese and garden and they sell stuff. So who knows? Very nice. Short and sweet. Mine will be short and sweet too. Oh, okay. (laughs) It's hard to get a lot of information off of ancient things. I know. That's why my first one took five minutes and that was being generous. Right. I mean, we don't know much about them. They're ancient, like prehistory, you know, kind of stuff. Seth Cohen, Brooke Davis, Blair Waldorf. Sound familiar? It Takes Three Network houses shows surrounding your favorite nostalgic teen dramas. Whether you are watching for the first time or you're binging for the fifth time, you'll definitely want to check us out. You can listen to Tree Hill Talk, Let's Talk OC, and Three Gossip Girls on your preferred listening platform. And for more information, visit ittakes3network.com. So mine is the Nazca Lines. Okay, I've never heard of Oh, you haven't heard of them? Oh, the Nazca Lines. The Nazca Lines, yeah. Yes. South America. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I got a lot of my information from history.com. They had a couple really good articles on it. Um, And they also read a press release from the Japanese team that found more glyphs. They're in the they're in the paper. They're in my report. So let's see. The Nazca lines are a series of geoglyphs, and these geoglyphs are designs or motifs that are carved into either the ground or the side of a mountain or rocks. And uh, the Nazca lines are in the Peruvian coastal plain about 250 miles or 400 kilometers, if you do metric, south of Lima, Peru in South America. They were created by the ancient Nazca people, Um, And they depict flowers, animals, human figures, and lines. So they're really, really big. So a lot of people didn't know how they made them at first because the Nazca lived like 2,000 years ago. So these things can just cover, they cover the desert floor, they're gigantic, and They've been studied for nearly 80 years, and people still don't know why in the world the Nazca made them. They have no idea why they covered the desert floor with geoglyphs, or even what they mean, but they have some speculations. So the Nazca lines are comprised of three basic types. They're straight lines, geometric shapes, and figures. So there's more than 800 straight lines that stretch across the Nazca Desert, and they crisscross each other all over the place. Some go on for as long as 30 miles. Wow. Yeah. In addition, there are more than 300 geometric shapes, and these include squares, triangles, trapezoids, spirals, arrows, zigzags, and wavy lines. But the most famous of the Nazca lines are those depicting animals and plants. Some of these are 1,200 feet across. Wow. Yeah. So these figures include, there's a spider, a hummingbird, a cactus, a monkey, a llama, a whale, a dog, a flower, a duck, a tree, and a lizard. And they're all like really stylized. So the ancient Nazca people also crafted human figures as well. There's um, a hand that, I, I can't remember exactly what shape it is. I think it's kind of like just a hand, like kind of facing out. And um, a lot of them are now indecipherable. They're so... They haven't been taken care of. People didn't know they were there, so they're hard to find. Um, And then there's one really famous one. It's a humanoid figure called the astronaut, which is an elongated figure with its one hand is upraised over its head, and its head is like really big and bulbous and has giant staring eyes. So a lot of people lend this to the idea that aliens helped the Nazca do these lines. Right. So... Recently, there's been a lot of new discoveries. Um, You would think that we would have found them all because they're gigantic and they're all over the floor of the the desert, but they now have high-resolution imagery, so they're able to find a lot more. So in 2011, a research team from Japan, using satellite imaging, discovered over 140 new geoglyphs. One new image depicts a decapitation and is around 14 feet by 10 feet, which is really small compared to 
30 miles or 1,200 feet. Right. So I find this really interesting. When I was learning about the Nazca Lines in an archaeology class years ago, we learned that they take trophy heads. And now it's trophy heads in quotation marks because we're not really sure if they're trophy heads. So a trophy head would be taken when you're at war, you cut off somebody's head that you're, you know, an enemy, and then you keep their head. And if you look up Nazca trophy heads, they are the things of nightmares. They're terrifying looking. Some of them are just skulls. Others are more mummified heads, and they still have, like, what would be eye sockets and stuff. Totally creepy. But what they would do is they would drill two holes in the head, one in the front in the 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 forehead and one in the back and then they would take a big heavy rope and they would string it through and they'd carry them around or hang them up okay so they find burials with them so they would have a mummy and when they would make a mummy um they would put them in a fetal position and wrap them up in like a cocoon but they find them buried with trophy heads so that they did scientists in about 2009 took enamel scrapings from the mummies and from the trophy heads and discovered that they were the same people Okay. living in the same area so not necessarily dna testing but like they ate the same food they drank the same water they lived in the same area they had the same amounts of chemicals like strontium and oxygen and carbon in their enamel which meant that these were probably people they were nazca also so they wouldn't necessarily be a trophy head because it's your neighbor so maybe a ritual Maybe okay. like a ritual sacrifice. Like we don't know why. Yeah. They... Or maybe just like a tribute to someone who died that you loved. And you're Possibly. like, I'm going to make their head a purse and carry it over my shoulder. <laughs> possibly. Possibly. Or slaves. Maybe right. they took slaves and they, you know, grew up in the same area. You, When the master of the house dies, we take all the slaves with us, perhaps could be like very egyptian i don't know they don't know what what the deal is with that but i find that fascinating Mm -hmm. so the japanese also have a couple of theories one of which is held by a lot of other archaeologists and researchers about why these giant geoglyphs are even in the desert so a lot of the really large figures that are on the ground particularly animals and some of the humanoid figures, they have a bunch of pottery pottery vessels that have been smashed around them as an offering. So they could be religious sites Mm -hmm. that people would pilgrim to. So the straight lines would take you to a pilgrimage site, you'd smash your stuff around it, and then you would keep going. Okay. They also are finding a bunch of geoglyphs on the sides of hills that have been kind of obscured. So those would be ones you would just look at. They might be mile markers, Right, I was just going to say, maybe they're mile markers. Yeah, okay. Exactly, for trade routes or whatever. So there was also a Peruvian archaeologist who in 2018 announced that they had discovered 50 previously undetected geoglyphs using high-definition drone video. So there's the desert is literally covered in these things, covered in them. So a lot of people speculate how in the world did an ancient civilization that lived over 2,000 years ago create stuff so large? Well, it's kind of easy. They used math. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how do the Egyptians make the pyramids? You know, I, I, because a lot of people. They used math. Engineer and people. Engineer yeah, they were people. engineers. They used yeah. math. They um, used the position of the sun. They used markers. They ropes, grid formations, X and Y axes. Astounding. I know, right? Crazy. So Cornell University, a Cornell University class, um, recreated two of the Nazca lines on their campus quad to prove that ancient people were more than capable of creating these massive geoglyphs all by themselves. So how exactly are they created, though? So researchers believe that the Nazca culture, which began around 100 BC and flourished all the way from 1 AD to 700 AD, created most of the the Nazca geoglyphs. However, the Shavan or the Shavin and the Pacaras cultures, which predate the Nazca, contributed to the lines as well. So the Nazcas just continued the tradition of creating these giant pictures on the ground. So what it is, is the Rio Grande de Nazca River Basin, which is this big desert floor, is covered with a layer of iron oxide coated pebbles. And if you remove them and you dig down about a foot to 15 inches, the rust colored rocks 
change to a layer of light colored sand. So by removing the top layer of dirt, you get this nice contrast and you get these beautiful lines that you can, you know, you can make all kinds of pictures with, which wouldn't be that hard to figure out. I mean, people have been doing this kind of stuff for centuries. Like, oh, look, look, it's light down here. Let's make pictures. You know, this is a giant canvas. You can't Mm -hmm. really farm in it. Let's make it a tribute to the gods or whatever. So studying the Nazca lines. So they've been studied since about 1926. And I'm going to try to say his name. I wrote it phonetically, but it is a Peruvian name. So I'm probably going to butcher it. Tobirio Mija Wasapi, I think is what it is. It has an X in it. So I'm not totally sure how you pronounce his name, but I'm pretty sure it's Wasapi. He began a systematic study of the lines in 1926. However, they didn't receive worldwide attention until 1930 when an American pilot flew over them and was like, holy shit, there's giant pictures in the ground. And the Peruvians are like, no duh, asshole. (laughs) It's been here for 2,000 years. So people really started to take notice after the Americans discovered them. Isn't that just the way? So there's a couple different theories that people have had over the decades as to why these things are there. Um, Paul Kosak, which is an, who was an American historian, studied the lines from both the ground and the air in the 1930s to the 1940s, and he discovered that one of the lines coincided with the winter solstice and concluded the whole thing was a giant calendar. Mm. He's like, oh, that one matches. It's a calendar. So then not long after, a German woman, an archaeologist named Maria Ritchie, um, she came to the similar conclusion and thought that the giant pictures of the animals and people on the ground were representations of constellations. Oh. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. It is like kind of a calendar then, perhaps. Others think it is ancient trade routes. So some researchers have speculated that the lines delineate ancient trade routes to and from coastal areas or um, roadways to worshipping sites. So those big, long, straight lines, you would walk along them and you would get to different either worshipping sites or they'd be trade routes, depending on what you were following. Some think they're alien. I love this. Alien beacons or runways for spacecrafts. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> They conclude, these people who believe this, conclude that there is no way that ancient people could have created lines without extraterrestrial assistance due to their vast size. So ancient brown, yeah, a- ancient brown people can't do this kind of stuff. Same thing with the pyramids. People but think the aliens. Ancient, I know people, yeah, I suppose people think yeah, it's, just the it's just it racism. It is. Oh, my God. It's so ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, if uh, these were, like, found in I don't, European settlements, would we Oh, it wouldn't thinking... be a question. No question at all. <laughs> Europeans totally made if, these. Like, no right, one ever yeah. thinks Stonehenge was... was made by aliens. Exactly. Good it point, It was the Druids. Cindy. Yeah. No one... I've never heard the theory that Stonehenge was made by aliens. aliens. It's always been really smart white folks. Good point. But <laughs> all of the brown folks clearly had alien help. Oh, it's they the had only to way. have. It's the only had way. Had to have. Yeah. yeah, they can't do it any other way. They're just not smart enough. They don't know math. Even though the Inca, I'm pretty sure it was Inca or the Maya, created zero. One of those two. I'm pretty yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah, created zero. All right. So agricultural theories. Some more recent research suggests that Nazca lines relate to water, which is a priceless commodity in the desert landscape. The geoglyphs aren't for irrigation or for a guide to locating water, but rather a part of a ritual for the gods or a prayer for rain. So you create a line whenever you needed more rain. So that's why there's so many. Okay. Because they just kept making more and more to appease the gods to get more rain. Right, because there's never enough rain in the desert. Yeah, and it's actually, this, this part of the world is one of the driest points in the entire earth like it gets very little rain very little wind and that's why they're so well preserved oh. that's what that's why the lines sure. have pre- prevailed for 2000 years is because yeah. there's very little erosion happening mm-hmm. so some scholars point to the animal figures on the the for, the forest floor on the desert floor represent water and fertility that have been discovered in other nazca settlements on pottery so they think the two are related like oh we know that this pot was a fertility pot and it has hummingbirds on the outside of it so the hummingbird probably means fertility that sort of thing okay so they relate the two together 
In 2015, researchers presenting at the 80th Annual Meeting of the Society of American Archaeologists argued that the purpose for the lines changed over time. So perhaps at first they were used as pilgrimage sites to temples and ritual procession routes, and then later on it became more for you know agriculture, and then later on it you know just it kind of progressed as time went on. Like maybe the next generation didn't know why three generations before had done these, but they did them for a new reason. Mm-hmm. So it changed over time. Yeah, that makes so, sense. Yeah, yeah, I thought so too. So um, because they didn't have a written language. Right. You know, their belief system is is constantly evolving. It's fluid. It's not rigid like a written, you know, testament. So the Nazca Lions are a UNESCO World Heritage Site. However, there's some preservation issues. In 2009, because of global warming, the typically arid desert, desert experienced unprecedented rainfall. Mm. So there was heavy rainfall along the Pan American Highway, which connects pretty much every South American country to one another, and it deposited large amounts of clay and sand onto some of the geoglyphs. Then in 2014, some idiots from Greenpeace decided that they were going to go out there and do a media stunt, and they damaged part of the hummingbird while laying down a large sign that called for renewable energy. So they trampled through the forbidden archaeological site, which is cordoned off. You're not allowed to be out there, and they damaged some of the geoglyphs. What fucking idiots? Yeah, I'm sorry. You're part of Greenpeace, or hi? Are you all stupid hypocrites, or uh, what? Kind I think fight? anybody who's a radical is a fucking idiot, and a little a little hypocritical. I mean, don't you think? Yeah, that you're yeah. kind of. You're wait. They wanted a clean energy fuel. What was the purpose of going to this ancient site to fuel that? I think it was because they had a big sign that they were laying down the desert floor that could be seen from people flying overhead. And I I guess they figured that they could go to a spot where there's a lot of people flying over, a tourist, right? A a lot of tourists fly over the area. So they figured they would get a lot of use, a lot of mileage out of their sign because people would be seeing it. And that's the people that they want to target with their message? Yeah, you know, people flying around in helicopters. Looking at the line. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah. Like like you think that they're going to see your sign and give a shit? No, they're going to see that you're fucking, <laughs> you covered up part of the hummingbird, you assholes. Like, what are you even doing out here in the first place? The thing is, like, the lines are so big, you don't even know you're standing on them when right. you're there because they're massive. Yeah. Oh, just a bunch of idiots. And then in 2018, a commercial truck driver was arrested after driving through the area. He just went off-roading, just drove his commercial truck I mean, I'm I am still hung up on the Greenpeace guys because I don't oh, expect that from a commercial trucker. I don't know why. Maybe if he's hauling like logs or something, he doesn't give a shit about the planet. But Greenpeace, I don't know. Go to JFK Airport with your sign and hold it up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right, right. Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, definitely people who are like flying, you know, airplanes. That's a really that's a lot. That's a big footprint. Yeah, I don't know. People are dumb. Um, yeah, so that's the Nazca Lions. Interesting. Cool. I knew nothing about them other than oh, good. just that they existed. Um, because when I was trying to find something to do for this week's episode, I Google, like, archaeological mysteries, and it was always sort of the top of the list. Right. Yeah, cool. that's why I was just like, well, I'll do it because I find it really fascinating. And I was like, oh, but I bet everybody's heard about it. Oh, well, they haven't heard my version. <laughs> yeah, and, and I've heard, I knew that they existed, but I knew nothing about it. So thank you for illuminating. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, I, in my research, I was expecting to find the hot air balloon theory, but I didn't find it luckily because I think that's totally been like garbage. So when I was studying these things, my art teacher who was doing the archaeology class, she was talking about how some people believed that the ancient Nazca had discovered how to make hot air balloons. So they would float the foreman up over the site who would direct people. But it's just like, well, just make a smaller version of it first. And then you just enlarge it with a grid. Yeah. I mean, duh, math. I mean, come on. Like, I mean, wow. the, these ancient people in South America figured out how to make a survey so they could grade the land to do aqueducts. Right. Like every other ancient culture of people, but we don't question that the Romans made the aqueducts. No, and I mean, did the when... aliens help the South Americans here with their aqueducts? Do we think? So I know, but the Romans, you know, whatever. They're like a Western civilization. They're white. We're 
we can be comfortable with those guys figuring it out on their own. Um, when the Spanish first came to the New World and were down in South America killing everybody, the definition of culture was cultivate. You had to be able to cultivate the land. Mm -hmm. So when they came to South America and saw that the ancient peoples there, the indigenous had terraced the sides of the mountains and had their own irrigation, they had to redefine what culture was because these people had cultivated the land. Right. And they were just like, oh, my, we can't share that with you. You guys can't be cultured. You are heathens. Right. We have to change the definition of culture. Oh, my God. I know, right? All righty. I'm done talking now. (laughs) Well, yeah, this has been Demi World. Um, I'm Cindy. And I am Kelly. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. This has been Demi World. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Demi World Podcast. You can visit our website for show notes at demiworld.net. If you want to reach out, you can email us at demiworldpodcast at gmail. You can support us on Patreon at Demi World Podcast. And remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Thanks for listening. Bye.